Glad I combed my hair. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Yamas, can you hear us? Yes, ma'am. Oh, good. Thank you. Sorry about that. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Ms. Ramos, is that you that just signed on with the telephone? Yes, I was on earlier. My phone died, so I had to plug um, it in. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Just wanted to make sure that was you. Hi, Patricia. Thank you. Hi, how are y'all? Great. Oh nice to see you here tonight. It's fabulous to be with the group. It's wonderful. Oh, my gosh. Oh. Working. Yeah, I'll try to make sure it was working. <laughs> I said I'm done. I have to. When you're not speaking, can you please mute your phone or computer, please? Gang's all here, looks like. Uh, mm. I would say Council Member Lewis. Oh, you're right. Gang's almost all here. Saint, happy St. Patrick's Day, everyone. Green donuts at the high school this morning. My elementary, my elementary school was uh, running.
run by British nuns, and a number of them were from Ireland. So we learned a lot about St. Patrick, St. Patrick's Day. on my green shirt from Merced County made a fair screen fair from a number of years ago. Chance to show double colors. Hopefully we get our fair back next year. Lucy, you want to, might want to make sure that Mrs. Lewis is using that first login link as opposed to the second one. Okay, let me call her. Everybody's here now. Welcome, Ms. Lewis. All right. So I will go ahead and call the March. Uh, get ready here for our March 17th, 2021 uh, City Council meeting. And uh, let everyone know that temporary public comment email established for City Council meetings uh, can be sent by email to the city clerk at lostbanis.org. And if it's received prior to 4 p.m. of the day of the meeting, it will be read into the record. Um, also, you can uh, mail your comments to City Hall and drop them off in the, in the water bill, or you can mail them here to our address at 520J Street, Los Banos, California. Um, we will go ahead and call the meeting to order and we will go to police chief breezy for the pledge of allegiance Mr. mayor thank you i pledge allegiance to the flag of the united states of america and to the republic for which it stands one nation under god and indivisible with liberty and justice for all Thank you, 
Chief Breezy. Moving on now to roll call. Ms. Melanie? Jones? Present. Lambert? Here. Lewis? Here. Maria? Here. We have a quorum. Everyone is present. Um, Next item will be consideration of approval of the agenda. Now, um, I understand uh, staff, we wanted to pull item nine, is that correct? I'm sorry, Mayor. I think Council Member Lewis had, uh, uh, would like to address that item. Okay, very good. Um, Mayor Pro Tem Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, um, I submitted a request uh, to remove item nine on the agenda in regards to the fiscal year 2021-22 budget for, um, priority workshop uh, and to make that a separate workshop uh, aside from the city council meeting. Okay, well, then if you'd like to make the motion to approve with that, uh, with, with that stipulation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, I'd like to approve uh, the agenda uh, for March 17th as submitted minus item nine for a separate date. Thank you very much. I have a motion by Mayor Pro Tem Lewis. Do I have a second? Mayor, Councilman Jones here. I'd like a second that. Thank you, Council Member Jones. I have a motion by Mayor Pro Tem Lewis and a second by Council Member Jones to approve the agenda as submitted minus item nine. Roll call, please. Jones. Yes. Lambert. Yes. Lewis. Yes. Yamas. Yes. Maria. Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Agenda has been approved. Next order of business is the proclamation recognizing Cesar Chavez Day. Cesar Chavez is a very important, uh, very important person in the history of not only farm workers, but in the Latino and Hispanic communities. Um, and our proclamation reads, whereas on March 31st, 1927, Cesar Estrada Chavez was born and later became a founder and full-time labor activist for the National Farm Workers Association whose mission was battling racial and economic discrimination against farm workers by utilizing the principles of nonviolence. And whereas the NFWA became United Farm Workers of America, the first successful farm workers union in United States history with bargaining agreements that eventually covered 80,000 workers in California, Arizona, and Florida. And whereas in 1968, Cesar E. Chavez conducted a 25-day fast, reaffirming the UFW's commitment to nonviolence that resulted with a national awareness of the plight of farm workers. And whereas on April 23rd, 1993, his great leader passed away, leaving a legacy of service and nonviolent resistance to social injustice that has made an enduring impact on farm labor issues and inspired millions of Latinos to achieve educational and political success. And whereas on August 8, 1994, Cesar E. Chavez posthumously became the second Mexican American to receive the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian honor in the United States, and was honored by the state of California by the declaration of Cesar Chavez Day on the date of his birth. Now therefore be it proclaimed that the mayor and city council members of the city of Los Banos do hereby, hereby, hereby proclaim March 31st, 2021, as Cesar E. Chavez Day in Los Banos, and encourage all residents to recognize the contributions and the positive impact that Cesar E. Chavez has made for our nation's workforce, conscience, and future. And we officially present this to uh, Ms. Patricia Ramos Anderson. And we thank you for being here tonight to receive. Or would you like to say a few words, Patricia? Yes, thank you so very much, Mayor. And um, 
Uh, Patricia Ramos Anderson. I'm also the president of one of the largest civil rights organizations in the United States. Um, it's called LULAC League of United Latin American Citizens. Um, I was I had the privilege of meeting him when I was a very young child, and during the March of Sacramento. And what it was was the organization. What the movement was about. It was about safety, working conditions, um, the, their health. Um, also about some of the basic rights that workers needed to have. And, and I remember the march from Sacramento, from, from, from Central Valley all the way down to Sacramento. We were volunteers, and as a child, we were giving out the napkins and the little spoons and handing them out to all the, the marchers. And people down the road were giving out the food. And that was my first experience seeing what it was about. And from then on, um, and with Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers um, Union, you also had women in key roles. It was just and, and the religious group and organizations and students and, and you had from every realm were involved because it was about basic human rights for working conditions, from having water to breaks to areas to even go to the, the restroom. And um, it changed how organized labor happened throughout like after that in um, the cannery, packing houses. It, it evolved into um, not just in the agriculture area, but also in the industrial type of um, packing houses. And, and to be the daughter of a, 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 of a father that in the private sector of packing, they had the first women's pay equity um, um, an issue addressed that women would get paid the same as men drivers. And his daughter, 30 years later, you know, 20 years later, did the same thing and was part of the pay equity strike in San Jose with AFSCME. So, it's interesting how, as a child, small child, when you're exposed to certain things, how it really gives memories and and also what you're about. And this is what the movement of Cesar Chavez and the farmers workers, but also the women behind, like like um, Dolores Huerta, who's one of the co-founders too. So you had a lot of people involved, and um, and I I appreciate and I love this um, um, accommodation and date of Cesar Chavez. But we also have everyone else that was involved in was including the women that were at side by side and families and children and nonprofits and, and just basic families that were working in those conditions trying to make changes to make it safe for them. But it ended up becoming a, it evolved throughout um, working conditions in all types of um, sectors. So thank you again very much for this time and for the proclamation. It's very much appreciated. And I'm glad to see Los Banos, you know, acknowledging um, Cesar Chavez and also what it stood for because it also was part of the dairy industry. A lot of their workers that get involved were part of that movement too and folks didn't realize that. So again, thank you for your time and you guys have a wonderful day today and also happy St. Patty's Day from Patricia from St. Santa Patricia as we, as we say. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, thanks thank again you. and it's a great honor to present this today and you too have a great evening and rest of St. Patrick's Day. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. And got left. Thank you. Very good. So now we will move on to the public forum. Members of the public may address the city council members on any item of public interest that is within the jurisdiction of the city council. This can include agenda and non agenda items. No action will be taken on non agenda items. Speakers may submit their comments by submitting a written statement limited to 250 words or less by dropping it off in the utility payment box at City Hall, 520 J Street, by mail or emailing the city clerk at cityclerk.lospanos.org. Comments received will be read into the record during the city council meeting. Ms. Malady, do we have any comments in the public forum? Um, let me refresh real quick to see if I missed something. I have received no comments. Thank you. Having received no comments, uh, we will close the public forum and move on to item seven, consideration of approval of the consent agenda. Items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine and will be voted on in one motion unless removed from the consent agenda by a city council member. And for that, uh, we will go to uh, our city clerk, Ms. Melanie. Items on the consent agenda are as follows. Warrants numbers 225859 through 226089 in the amount of $734,541.59. Item 
minutes for the March 3rd, 2021 City Council meeting. City Council Resolution number 6335, accepting public improvements for East Center, Phase 2A generally located within the area bounded by Center Avenue to the west, Pioneer Road to the south, Rainier Drive to the east, Pioneer Development Company. City Council Resolution number 6336, accepting public improvements for East Center, Phase 2B, generally located within the area bounded by Center Avenue to the west, Pioneer Road to the south, and Rainier Drive to the east, Pioneer Development Company. And those are the items to be approved as submitted. Thank you. Uh, are there any items, any council members uh, uh, wish to pull any items from the agenda? Uh, council Member Jones? No. Council Member Lambert? No, Mr. Mayor. Mayor Pro Tem Lewis? No, Mr. Mayor. And Council Member Yamas? No, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there, so the chair will entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda as submitted. Mr. Mayor, Council Member Lewis, I'd like to make a motion to approve the consent agenda as submitted. Thank you. Uh, I have a motion by Council Member Lewis. Do I have a second? I'll second that, Mr. Mayor. Yamas. Thank you, Council Member Yamas. I have a motion by Mayor Pro Tem Lewis and a second by Council Member Yamas to approve the consent agenda as submitted. Roll call, Ms. Melanie. Jones? Yes. Lambert? Yes. Lewis? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Faria? Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Now we'll move on to item eight, public hearing. 8A, uh, and if you challenge the proposed action as described herein in court, you may be limited to raising only those issues you or someone else raised at the public hearing described herein or in written correspondence delivered to the city at or prior to the public hearing. Item A, to receive public comment and consideration of the City of Los Banos General Plan and Housing Element Annual Progress Report for calendar year 2020 and to consider an exemption for the requirements to the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA, pursuant to section 15061B3 of the CEQA guidelines as the annual report has no significant effect on the environment. And we will go to Community and Economic Development Director Elms. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and City Council. Um, so this particular item is um, an item that I bring to you annually, and it's a requirement as um, I will go through within the presentation. It is a requirement of the government code. Um, this process is meant to um, be a public hearing process so it is transparent to the community where the city is with our housing element um, what progress we've made and what policies we've implemented so the housing element um, annual progress report as i said it is a government code requirement it requires that each jurisdiction prepare and submit an annual progress report on its housing element by april 1st of each year it is required to contain the following. It, we have to provide the status of the housing element and progress in its implementation, the progress in meeting the city's regional housing needs, and any actions taken by the city toward completion of those programs within the housing element. The city is required to be, uh, this, this annual progress report is required to be reviewed and considered by the city's legislative body, in this instance, the city council, and subsequently submitted to the Office of Planning and Research of the State of California and to the Department of Housing and Community Development, HCD, um, also of the State of California, but it does not require the state's approval. The purpose of the annual progress report is to remain compliant with government code and housing element law. Uh, it's also to update the City Council on housing development and implementation of the housing element and also to update the community on um, the progress that we've made on our housing element and to third ensure eligibility for straight state grant funding. Uh, all of state grant funding community development block grant CDBG um, also park grants. Um, 
are tied to compliance with the housing element. Um, so the proposed annual progress report ensures that the city will remain in compliance for future grant opportunities and state funding. Also, I did want to mention um, the city has been the recipient of Senate Bill 2, SB 2 funding for planning. Uh, we've received um, planning grants, one in the amount of 150,000 and the other in 160,000. Um, and that's gone th to reimburse the city um, on the expenses of updating our general plan. And we would not have been eligible if we were not in compliance with our housing element. Um, this is a table that was um, also included in your packet, but this table represents the city's progress with our regional housing needs allocation. So this is the amount of housing that has been produced within the city of Los Banos since 2016. And that is when um, this housing element, this cycle that we were in was adopted by the city council. Um, so on, if I can break down this uh, particular table for you, I didn't know if you can see my cursor, but um, within this column, it says RENA, Regional Housing Needs Allocation um, by Income Level. And this is what the state of California um, within our housing element has implemented to the city mandated to the city of Los Banos is our regional housing need allocation. This top number um, for very low income is actually extremely low income and very low income combined together. And that is why it, it seems to be disproportionate. It is not, it's just technically two income levels that got combined together um, because that is how we report it back to the state. The state combines those two income categories. Um, and then we have low income, moderate income, and then above moderate income. So we are to report on the housing um, that of, on, based on building permits that have been issued. So in 2016, you'll see that the city did pretty good in the very low income category. Um, we had extremely low and very low income units that were built. And this is um, attributed to the Overland Courts project. If you can recall, that's a senior affordable housing project um, that consisted of 70 units technically it's 69 units plus a manager's unit and so um, we did receive quite a bit of credit in 2016 for the issuance of those permits um, so you'll see that reflected here um, and then what you will see common um, as the above moderate um, row is where we consistently have issuance of building permits each year and that is that is where we are steady um, and in 2017, we only issued building permits in above moderate category. In 2018, we did have um, one in one building permit issued in the low income category and then four in moderate and the rest were above moderate. In 2019, um, we had two in moderate, the rest were above moderate. And this year, um, we've done a little bit better. Um, and this is attributed to Sunset Hills development and Mr. Joe Rocha and the projects that um, he is under construction. So those building permits were issued in 2020. And that's the year that's highlighted for you in that column. Um, that's the year we're reporting in is 2020. And if you recall, there is one unit on East Street, his East Street project that consists of eight new units that is deed restricted with a density bonus. So with that, we were able to, um, to report that to the state in that column, um, in, that, in that row. And then um, in addition to um, the eight units, he is also building a couple of units downtown on K Street. Um, and then we had just some infill projects that um, one unit that qualified as moderate. And then we issued in 2020, we issued 390 single family residential permits at above moderate. So in 2020, in total, we issued 402 residential building permits. 
Um, so total units, um, that's all um, added up for you in the next column. And really what, what is the meat and potatoes of all of this, um, of this particular table is at the very end, this total remaining RENA by income level. This is what we still have left to do according to what has been allocated to the city of Los Feliz. So we still have 563 units in the very low income. Um, we still have 398 units to develop in low income. 382 units to still um, develop in moderate. And then we do not need to develop. We are not man mandated to develop any more above moderate. Uh, we, we are at zero required to build. So I do want to go over implementation of the housing element. There are eight goals within the element that um, the city is required to implement. Um, so I do want to go over those quickly with you. Um, those are then further explained on um, as an attachment to your staff report with the table. Um, it then provides on the fourth column the status of that program implementation. So for goal number one, we're to provide adequate sites for residential development and alternate housing choices at affordable costs for all segments of the city. Two, we're to remove governmental constraints. Goal three, we're to encourage the maintenance and improvement and rehabilitation of the city's existing housing stock and to encourage the maintenance and upkeep of existing affordable housing. Ford were to achieve energy efficiency and housing activities. Um, let me see if I can move. There we go. Um, five, ensure that all residents have access to housing. Six, increase the percentage of homeowners in the city and provide adequate information on all possible housing assistance programs and distribute to homeowners, developers, and other residents. Seven, were to maintain an adequate percentage of affordable rental units within the city to accommodate all income groups and family types. That ties back to our arena. And then goal A is to encourage new development projects for special needs groups. Um, we've made quite a bit of progress, especially in goal eight. We've completely completed goal eight. Um, if you may recall back in 2020, um, March of 2020, we um, started with the updates of the housing element um, to accommodate those special needs housing. And then we were able to accomplish goal eight officially December 2nd, 2020, um, when those final ordinances were adopted to accommodate special needs housing and single room occupancy um, requirements uh, within our zoning code ordinance. So public comment, public notices were published in the Los Banos Enterprise on March 5th, 2021. And as of today's date, no comments have been received. Um, but at the conclusion of um, this presentation, I would ask that the city council would um, open the public hearing, receive testimony and any um, written comments provided to the city council. And then um, I would ask that the city council would adopt resolution number 6337, adopting the 2020 annual report on the city of Las Vegas' housing element. And that concludes my presentation. I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, uh, Ms. Elms. Um, we'll go ahead and open up the public hearing and uh, check with our city clerk to see if we've gotten any comments from the public. Um, I haven't received any to date, but being that it's a public hearing, they can submit them live during the council meeting. So let me check my email to see if anything like that has happened. Um, I have received no comments. Very good. Thank you. Having received no comments, we'll close the public hearing and go to council. Uh, Councilmember Jones, do you have any questions of staff? I do. Um, Stacy, got a question. Um, communities like Pacheco Courts and uh, Pacheco Village Apartments, do they not take in consideration of our housing element for uh, very low income? 
They do, um, but those, the city would have received credit on the years that they were built, which would have been 2008 and um, the second phase um, Pacheco courts. So you're referring, and just to be clear, those are um, Pacheco Village, Pacheco Court off of Gilbert Gonzalez Junior Drive, right? Off of Ward Road, those units Correct. out there? Yes, so the city would have received credit and would have been reporting that and the building permit issuance. So that was in a previous cycle of the housing element where the, that two, that year of 2008 um, would have been in the fourth cycle of the housing element and that's when the city got credit for it. And actually those 185 units based on the arena in the previous cycle brought the city um, to its maximum in that housing cycle. Uh, we are in it this cycle, which is between the period of 2014 to 2023, which has its own RENA uh, designation. So you're right, though, those units were given credit to the city, but on a previous housing cycle, those don't carry forward. We continuously have to ha meet new allocation. So pretty much every cycle, the state's going to keep pushing our coal plugs farther and farther out. And yes, and actually to just comment on that, what we are hearing and other cities are in the sixth cycle already of the housing element. They're, it's based on region. So there are already regions in the California city of uh, state of California that are already in the sixth cycle and their arena has doubled. So that is a, that's an extreme concern for uh, municipalities within the state of California. How are we to achieve these goals when it is difficult already to achieve our goals? Um, within our current arena and to have to double those numbers for extremely low, low um, and a moderate income levels. How are we to do that? Um, so we'll see what, you know, what the state, you know, what, what housing um, grants will be available, what funding sources will be available to help cities. Um, I will say for SB2 that that's been the funding sources that have been able to help cities get the technical support, get the planning support and documents in place to be able to support um, that, that type of housing within their communities. So um, the state is trying to set, help cities create the foundation to, to be able to implement and, and construct those types of units. Um, but it will be interesting to see what our arena allocation will be in the next cycle. We'll be probably getting into that um, 2022, um, that's based on a regional level as well. So our allocation is going to be allocated to the county of Merced and then the county will be with the with the methodology will be um, proportionately sharing that regional need to all of the cities and the county uh, within within our county. So um, you bring up a good question and a concern that is definitely on the radar with um, planning staff and you know, city staff in general. Um, it'll be interesting to see what our arena numbers are in the future. So in a nutshell, if we build another thousand um, market rate single family homes, that means we're gonna have to accommodate that with uh, more uh, uh, low income homes as well. So the more we grow, the more low income homes we're gonna need in every cycle, is that correct? It just kind of perpetuates itself. Um, so it's not based on, um, so if we stopped building um, moderate above moderate homes, so if we did not issue another, and this is hypothetical, if we did not issue another single family residential permit for above moderate, we would still be obligated to still meet you know, just because we've built a thousand above moderate doesn't mean now we have more low income. It, it's 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 a proportionate share. So if we didn't build another above moderate unit, we would still have our obligation of very low um, and low and moderate units to still build. So on permit and impact fees, can we uh, regulate based on which category the amounts of those fees are going to be or do they have to be pretty much in line with each other? Um, typically, it's based on density. So the higher density, the lower the fee is. Um, it is not based on affordability. Um, that is all within you know, the nexus that the city did for our development impact fees. Um, but there is, cal there is state law that does allow for cities to um, you know, either 
waive or consider special accommodations in terms of fees for affordable housing um, as a part of an incentive to be able to, to build that type of housing. That housing is very expensive. It is more expensive to build multifamily housing than it is to build single family residential units. Um, so that's, that's, that's the struggle in, in California, especially for Central Valley communities where it doesn't pencil out um, for development to build multifamily. Um, so it, it's trying to, to incentivize, develop programs and try to, to balance um, that need. Okay. And, and to be clear, I'm not uh, advocating for more affordable housing. Typically what comes with that is a lot more crime, a lot more issues all throughout the city. So it's a lot more of a tax burden on our taxpayers right now as it is. So it's just going to be an ongoing challenge that we're going to have to try to balance out and it's not going to be easy. And it seems like every time we think we have it under control, the state comes in and change the, the rules of the game. So thank you, Stacy. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Uh, Mr. Lambert, any questions? Uh, nothing here, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Ms. Lewis, any questions? No questions, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Yamas. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Director Helms, so from what I understand, the biggest obstacle is the affordability to the builders to build these homes. Is that really what's happening here? Yes. Um, that That's one of the biggest obstacles is uh, that those projects don't pencil out. Um, you know, there isn't um, a ton of subsidies out there. It's competitive to be able to get subsidized for affordable housing. Um, subsidies that are out there are tax credits, for instance, um, but that requires um, a competitiveness and a rating and, and years of waiting to be able to be eligible um, for a project to get tax credits. Um, one other issue that is difficult for the city of Los Angeles that makes us a little bit more unique is that we are a non-entitlement city for CDBG. And what that means is that the city of Los Manos, because we are less than 50,000 people, we are not directly allocated funds from HUD for housing. So comparing the city of Los Manos to say the city of Merced, that is an entitled jurisdiction, they get a direct allocation from HUD for housing and it's to be used for housing. And so they are able to incentivize developers to build affordable projects, affordable income projects, because they can help subsidize with that HUD funding. Unfortunately, the city of Los Banos, we are not eligible. We are, um, because we are a non-entitlement, we have to compete with other non-entitlement cities throughout the entire state of California. So every city that is less than 50,000, we have to compete with on a whole slew of different projects, whether it's park renovations, code enforcement, police stations, fire stations, you name it. If it's a project that could be covered under CDBG, you're competing with all of these cities, you know, for those various projects and it's very hard to do. Um, we've not been successful uh, using Overland Courts. They were very lucky to get tax credits and that's how Overland Courts was eventually developed. But just to remind the council, the city did apply for CDBG and we were not awarded. Our application wasn't strong enough um, to compete with the other with the other applications in that category. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, one question from me, uh, and that is, what's the difference? What is the uh, deed restricted or non deed restricted uh, mean? So deed restricted means that um, there's a recorded restriction um, on the property that requires that unit to remain affordable for a certain period of years. Um, in the instance, the, the credit that we got in 2020 was for a density bonus. And per the city's density bonus ordinance, that unit has to remain affordable in the low income category for 50 years, I believe is the threshold. Um, so that stays on that property. So if a new owner takes over, that unit is to remain um, at that income category. Um, and this is because the city was able to give more density to the project. And in exchange, we got a commitment, a deed restriction on the property that that 
that unit's to remain low income. So um, it, it binds the property, it encumbers it with that low income, but it also, also it, it requires the property owner to annually submit proof to staff that they are meeting that low income category. Non-deed restricted just means that um, when the unit was built, we looked at the rental rental um, agreement and the the rental rent in the surrounding area, and the state of California has an affordable um, an affordability calculator, housing calculator, and we use that to determine. But there is no deed restriction. Technically, the property owner could um, change that income level um, at any time. Okay, very good. Thank you. And the consequences if we don't meet these numbers, um, what would they be? So currently, um, the consequences for not being able to fully achieve RENA, there really hasn't been any monetary um, consequences um, or um, any threat for non-compliance with the housing element. The, this, the, the state looks at RENA as at least RENA, not our goals. The goals are a different thing, um, but at least for RENA, it's, it, it's, you're trying to achieve, you're trying to attain, you know, you're trying to, this is your goal. This is, this is what you're trying to achieve within this cycle of your housing element. Um, we were required to rezone property. That's also part of our housing element. It was a part of the unaccommodated need that got rolled forward. Um, so we were required to rezone five acres of property that had got rolled forward. But that uh, the way that the housing element, it's it's separated between the goals and your arena. So you're really you have your goals to achieve and you also have your your housing production. But that is more of you know, a goal that you are trying to achieve. Um, uh -huh. The state hasn't said, you know, you shall, um, this, they've just said, this is your proportionate share. This is what we would like you to achieve. Um, okay. Now, our next housing cycle, those, that, those units that we have not been able to achieve in this cycle may be rolled forward. So though those could be some consequences that have not happened historically, but we should be prepared that if we do not accomplish, if we are not able to achieve these goals in this cycle, that they could be rolled forward and rolled into the next arena. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, if there are no further questions, uh, Chair would entertain a motion to adopt City Council Resolution Number 6337. Mayor, Council Member Labor here. I'll make a motion to accept resolution number 6337 as it reads. Thank you very much. Um, do I have a second? Mr. Mayor, I'll second that, Yamas. Thank you, Mr. Yamas. So I have a motion by Council Member Lambert and a second by Council Member Yamas to approve City Council Resolution Number 6337, adopting the 2020 Annual Report on the Status of the Housing Element of the General Plan and Progress in its Implementation. Ms. Melody, roll call. Jones? Yes. Lambert? Yes. Lewis? Yes. Lamas? Yes. Maria? Yes, motion carried unanimously. Thank you very much, Ms. Elms. Your excellent presentation. Um, next, we move to our COVID-19 status update. City Manager Terrazas. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I do, I do have a brief update this early evening um, and then did want to uh, clarify that uh, this item also does include Council's consideration of a resolution uh, to continue the declaration of the existence of a local emergency. Uh, so uh, Merced County continues to be uh, in the purple tier, uh, in those tiers established by the state of California, 
again, the purple tier, which is the uh, most restrictive of tiers in terms of uh, business openings and, and openings in relation to the economy. Uh, 30,000 confirmed cases, a 15.1 uh, 15.1 uh, per 100,000 cases, um, a positivity rate of 6.6%, um, and 425 deaths uh, in the county. Uh, the one number that is keeping the, the county from moving to the red tier um, is the daily case rate per 100,000. Uh, that number needs to be at fewer than 10 uh, uh, for the county to move uh, to the red tier. Um, and those, those numbers need to be consistent for two weeks uh, before the county can move uh, to, the, to the red tier. Um, then in relation to vaccines, um, we're seeing more vaccines, you know, coming and being distributed. Uh, about 40,000 vaccines have been distributed in the county, uh, which is a vaccina vaccination rate uh, of about 7.1%. Um, these, uh, these numbers, this data uh, is available on the Merced County uh, COVID-19 website. Um, again, my, my, my update's brief uh, this afternoon, Mayor, uh, but as part of the update, uh, the staff is uh, recommending that the council uh, adopt resolution 6338, uh, continuing the declaration of a local emergency. Um, so that's all I have today, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, council, any questions? Uh, Mr. Jones? Yes, Mayor. Um, so what are we still getting financially from the state for declaring a um, Let's see, by having this emergency declaration still out there? Uh, and, are and, we projected to see more money coming in? I can answer oh. that question, Alex. Um, so we are not seeing anything more from the CARES Act funding. We received um, the money and we've already, we already expended it through the end of December. We, the FEMA, however, is still open. And we still have the right to claim any expenses in relation to FEMA. However, FEMA is a lot more limited and they pay for overtime costs that are in relation, direct relation to COVID. And they will pay for equipment and materials that are in um, relation to equipment. There was a change recently. They used to pay 75%. There was a recent change that they would pick up 100%. Um, we can't obviously use the CARES funding and then do the same for FEMA. So that is ongoing. We don't um, have an end date at this point in time for FEMA. And then, of course, there's the new money that is still being dis or was approved. Um, the estimate for the city of Los Banos is over $7 million. Um, and we are still researching exactly what we can do with that money. There are four different um, allowable um, categories, I guess I can say, in the bill. Um, they just did an update, but I didn't get to attend it. So I'm, I'm trying to find time to re-watch the um, webinar to find out. But it's, um, like I said, there's four different categories. Some of it is very specific. A lot of it has to do with um, assistance towards the the city itself so i mean the residents as far, far as small businesses and things like that go there are some infrastructure costs there are possible employee costs so that's something that we'll be bringing to council soon to let them know exactly how those expenditures can be spent okay so let, let me ask you this um right now do we jeopardize losing that seven million dollars if we do not clear a uh, declaration in existence of local emergency? Um, my just, assumption, or is that still guaranteed to us? Um, my assumption would be yes, that we would use it. And I'm just saying that if it's based on the same terms as the CARES Act, but I can't 100% answer that question. Sorry. Alex, do okay, you know? Yeah, no, I, I haven't seen anything that, that says a local municipality would have to have a, a declaration of a local emergency to be eligible for the funding. But 
Um, I guess one my, my one thought would be possibly it could be necessary to receive the funding, and I, I wouldn't uh, wouldn't want the city to jeopardize that funding going forward. That's seven point seven million dollars. Uh, we're just not sure at this point. Yeah, and in so, addition to that, my concern would also be reimbursing the CARES money if for some reason we decided to take it away. And again, I don't know that that's a fact, but it, it I would be um, concerned about it. Well, what were the terms of the care money on how long we have to keep this declaration in place? Um, I don't know the specific terms on that, but we have to have the reporting and everything for five years. And we haven't fully, we fully expended the funds, but we haven't finished the funding. In fact, I'm waiting for them to, I mean, finish the reporting. So I'm waiting for them to or open the portal this week to find out any extended terms. Okay, so I, I don't care whether we keep the local emergency in place or not. My concern is the businesses that are still closed, the restaurants where you can't dine inside, any salons, barbers, gyms, things like that. I mean, here's, here's my argument. I can spend all day going up and down Walmart's aisles, touching every single product, but I can't sit for an hour inside a restaurant. Makes no sense. I want to make sure code enforcement is backing off these restaurants, these businesses that want to open because bottom line is we're not paying their bills. So that's where I'm at. I hope the rest of the council's on board with that uh, train of thought there. So if you guys want to keep the local emergency, that's fine. I just want these businesses to open back up regardless of what tier we're in, because really, I don't think it matters. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Uh, Mr. Lambert, any questions? Uh, yes, sir, Mayor. I, I'm actually going to agree with uh, Councilmember Jones. Uh, you know, if if, if we're not going to, which uh, by my understanding, she's not really for sure, uh, Sonia, but uh, if we keep uh, this resolution, um, I, I myself, you know, being as the business owner, uh, you know, it, it's it, it, it's hard, and I, I can just understand how all the other businesses are. Um, you know, it, it's it's kind of rough, but I, I I'm with Councilman Jones. I, I, if we need to keep it so we don't lose the CARES Act money, uh, I, I'm definitely for it. Um, but I, I uh, it's kind of rough. I also would like to ask the 7.7 .7 million. Um, my understanding was this per capita. Uh, is this where we got the number for 7.7 .7 million? For, for, for like the, the for the population of the cities I know the, I know I know how it was worked out um, <clears throat> and that was uh, it was worked based on the CDBG formula and so entitlement cities as uh, Ms. Elms mentioned in the previous item, got a great deal more money per capita, uh, but uh, not entitlement cities, the system was based on a per capita basis, the way I understand it. And, uh, That's the, correct. The CDBG, oh, yes, the CDBG formula is very complex. Uh, it goes on for pages and pages. It has to do with growth levels, and, uh, percentage of growth, size of the city and whatnot. But primarily, the primary difference is that entitlement cities, like Merced, got a very large chunk of money in comparison to non-entitlement cities, which were primarily just per capita. Is that a uh, pretty accurate uh, analysis? Yeah. Yes, Mr. Mayor. So that just basically just goes off of more or less businesses then. Um, that are inside, uh, inside the city limits. It has to do with the population level and it's a, uh, an entitlement city is 50,000 or over primarily there's a larger city in Los Banos. that's the only Merced's the only one in the county correct uh, yeah I understand and of course I've seen that that number also I was just kind of curious how they with only 40,000 more people than what we actually are but they're over the 50,000 uh, population where yeah, we're, I, I, we're still in thousand Mr. Tarazas I, my, my only comment would be that higher that higher level of funding directly relates to their in, entitlement city status. Um, so that's over oh, that fifty thousand. Correct. Yes. Yes, Councilmember Lambert. Uh, there are 
are some uh, there have, are some reports from our uh, our lobbying organizations like U.S. Mayors and uh, League of Cities, National League of Cities, that they do have uh, they laid it out a little more cleanly, a little easier to read than what comes straight out of Congress. And so, if we can get any of those reports out to the council, um, that would be great. And I think that I think that would probably clear things up uh, quite a bit. Um, I know I was disturbed by the difference as well. Uh, but uh, lo and behold, once again, we are not an entitlement city, so we are not entitled. Any other questions, Mr. Lim? Uh, so, right quick again uh, for for Sonia, Sonia. So if you get this information off the portal for the for the, are you going to be able to get that back up? Yeah, they actually have an FAQ um, that came along with the recording I was speaking of, and I could forward that to council. Um, I think it had a lot of good bullet points in there that might clear up some of your questions. Okay, thank you, Sonia. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Lewis, any questions? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I don't have any questions, questions, but I do have a statement. and. I, I'm increasingly concerned because uh, Mr. Jones and Mr. Lambert have brought up some concerns. Mr. Jones had questions that we that can't be answered tonight, but yet we're we're being asked to make a decision on information we don't have. Now, if this is not some de dead dire emergency tonight, uh, I'd like to see this come back and those questions uh, be answered. The frequently asked questions be presented to the council so that we have an opportunity to read and not have to off the cuff make a decision about things that we don't have information on. And, and I, I don't like that type of uh, working atmosphere. We need to have the information before us to be able to read it and regurgitate it in order to make a, a, a good sound decision. So that's my take on it. I, I cannot vote for something that I don't have all the information on. Thank you, Ms. Thank Lewis. You. Mr. Yamas? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, well, I agree with Ms. Lewis, that uh, Council Member Lewis, that we do need the information. We do need to be able to process it, and digest it, and make a sound determination based on sound data. And to that, I would ask that, you know, recently we had an outbreak at City Hall, right? Several of our, our employees uh, were sick. And I don't recall, or maybe I missed it, the the severity, the length of the illness, uh, were the family members cross-contaminated? You know, that's all data that we have readily really available to us. And that's also a sampling uh, of what the effects of this, this uh, COVID-19 virus does to us. Uh, so I'd like to have that information. Um, and also, can we modify our restrictions and still be in compliance with the uh, emergency declaration. Uh, so some these are some of the questions I'd like to have so that I can, again, make a intelligent decision on. But generally, I, I think that uh, I think that we should start looking towards uh, addressing the dire situation that many of our businesses are, are experiencing. Remember, they're not just, it's not just a business that we're looking at, it's the family members, it's the homes, it's the investments, lifelong investment that these folks have put into, into our city. They've invested into it, and I think that we need to start taking proactive measures to, to, to address these concerns. Um, very good. Well, uh, Mr. Then, Mayor, well, could, I, could, I, uh, could I make a yes, couple of comments? I was going to go to you, Mr. Vaughn, uh, regarding the continue. Go ahead. So state law requires that this uh, local emergency be reviewed every 60 days, and we are at the 60-day mark on this one. This is, I think, about the fourth or fifth time that you've considered this since we uh, adopted the original local emergency. So in terms of a drop-dead date, there is one, and we're probably within a couple of days of that. We've been calendaring this every 60 days because we're required and you're required to reconsider it over 60 days. The local emergency does not set forth its own restrictions on businesses and red tier, purple tier, white tier, 
those are all coming down from the state and from the Merced County Health Department. So this declaration of local emergency doesn't have its own restrictions. Those are restrictions that are set forth by the Merced County Health Department and Governor Newsom. If you were to abolish this proclamation, those restrictions would not go away because you're under the jurisdiction of the Merced County Health Department, who is under the jurisdiction of the state of California. And so this proclamation doesn't essentially uh, have any restrictions in it that aren't restrictions coming down from the state. So if you were to not adopt this tonight, um, the, local, the proclamation of local emergency would go away. You potentially could be jeopardizing future funding that would be available to the city through the COVID acts. And you would not accomplish what I think I'm hearing, which is you would not accomplish wiping out the red tier, purple tier restrictions that the state of California and the Merced County Health Department are abiding by. Um, they, they have jurisdiction over those, not the city of Los Banos. This proclamation, however, would allow you um, to be stricter than that if you wanted to, and we're not asking for you to do that um, through this proclamation or through any future proclamations. So essentially, this is just maintaining the uh, status quo that there is a local emergency still in effect, um, but it really doesn't go to the enforcement of the city or the county uh, rules regarding social distancing, etc. Does that does that help at all? I have a question. Go ahead. Yes, Mr. Yamas. I'm sorry, Mr. Lewis. Go ahead, Mr. Just, Yamas. Just let me add one thing. If you recall, early on we did go further than what the state of California and the county was doing in terms of our uh, requirement for masks in public places. So you're you're allowed to be stricter, but you're not allowed. You're you're, you're by by not having this proclamation, you're not going to wipe out the requirements of the state of California or the county of Merced. That makes sense. So in, in in extrapolating from that, then wouldn't we still be eligible for those funds because we would still be restricting and thus still be economically impacted, even though we don't have our own declaration, we're still under those restrictions, i.e. Our, our economy is still suffering, so we would still be eligible. Possibly, but I, I do know that the county of the city of Outwater did what you're contemplating doing, and I believe it cut them out of CARES Act funding. And so, Even frankly, they, this proclamation is more ceremonial and- that's, that's my point. That's my point exactly, is if it's just ceremonial and we're still under these restrictions, we're still suffering, our businesses are still suffering under the economic impact of those restrictions. So we should still be eligible for those funds because that's the intent of those funds. Except that when you're saying you're going to repeal and determine that there is no local emergency, you're essentially saying there are no there are no impacts to our businesses anymore. But we know that there are because we have state well, restrictions. Yes, but if you again, if you roll back the proclamation, you're making the statement that there aren't. So well, that, just, that's that's the risk you're taking, I think. That, but we just established that the proclamation has no effect on the restrictions. You have no exactly. authority over the restrictions. Exactly, that's my point. We have no authority where it, it does nothing for it. So it's just a proclamation. Well, you you could do things beyond the state and county restrictions if you wanted to that were localized uh, to Los Banos, for instance. Mayor? Councilman hey, Jones here. Jones? So I take this as this proclamation is just comes down to the money. So if we go forward with it, we keep our place in line to receive money if it comes. Doesn't mean anything else other than that. So it's up to us as council if we want to give direction to our city manager and our police chief about the enforcement 
of the state regulations with shutting down restaurants or making it outdoor only because I've talked to these restaurants. They would love to open up indoors and it's their discretion. It should be their discretion if they want to open up indoors. Some of them have liquor licenses that are state issue licenses that could be on the line. That's not our responsibility, but we can't hold these businesses back. We have more important things to do than worry about if a business wants to open up. So that's what I'm pushing for. I'm going to keep pushing for it every day, uh, regardless of this uh, emergency declaration. So I think we need to go forward with this declaration just to keep uh, standing in line for the money when it comes. And we need to make sure we give clear direction to our city manager, our police chief, and code enforcement on what we expect of them. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Uh, Ms. Lewis? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, my, my biggest concern with this going forward is that there's information that we don't have. And this is on our agenda tonight, just a few days before it has to be in force again. So going forward, if we have to end up doing this again, because the governor and the state of California has decided to keep cities clamped down, um, I would like to see this come at least, uh, you know, uh, uh, two meetings before it has to go in force so that if there are questions, it gives uh, staff time to get back to council to give us the information that we need. Um, these last minute kind of force things don't make me feel comfortable in making a decision, especially when questions arise from council members and staff doesn't have answers to give to us. We, we cannot do business that way anymore. So that that's basically where I stand on that tonight. And the rest of the council, um, if if they decide to go along with it, I'm okay with it. But that's my position um, as we move forward with this declaration tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, then when we make the, when someone makes the motion this evening, uh, I would recommend that we add the direction that rather than waiting the 60 days or uh, to the last meeting before the 60 days, that we bring it back every 30 days um, to for discussion. Um, and then that would give it a, a two council meeting cycles. So you would, in 30 days, you bring it back uh, for discussion. And then that discussion then could be uh, moved forward to the next second in line uh, meeting. Does that make sense? So this, today is the second meeting in March. So we would go ahead and bring it back in the second meeting in April for discussion to be put as an action item on the first meeting in May. And then we wouldn't be bumping into that second meeting in May 60 day deadline. And I think that would uh, set the council at ease from an information standpoint. Also, uh, we'll, I think there's a a desire to go ahead and approve this declaration tonight so that we don't lose out on money. But then in the future, we want to have more, uh, we want to have a little more information before that and have time to work that information. So um, is the, is the information that's lacking is whether or not this affects, um, funding to the city. Is that, is that the primary question that's not been answered tonight? Because um, I don't know that there's going to be an answer to that. I think there were several questions proposed by council member Jones uh, and Sonia answered some and our city manager answered some and to those uh, questions, uh, they were not able to give an answer because they didn't have the information. It still needed to be researched. So that's, that's where I'm coming from. We, we don't have any room for, for that kind of uh, information coming to council and us making decisions on projects, uh, motions, resolutions, whatever that need to be moved forward and not have the complete package to understand what we're voting on. And, and that's my position on it. Nothing more. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, then I think, excuse me, um, I've got to, it's on silent, but decided to buzz. Um, so I would recommend that when it, whoever wants to make the motion uh, would include direction to bring discussion of the item back in, 30, in, the, uh, in the 30 day cycle. So the motion could be made in 40, you know, at, 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 the, at the 45 day cycle. 
so to speak, so that we don't have this bumping up into the deadline. Um, and I think that will probably set things at ease. As far as enforcement and how we enforce that, uh, that would not be part of this. I don't think this would be part of the declaration of the emergency. That might be another item, another action, and it might be a council member request if you want to do it. The only problem, I, I would fear the risk that, you know, making a council decision to, to uh, not enforce uh, state laws in place may put us in a little bit of jeopardy, uh, particularly in the areas of funding. But that I would have to leave that to the pleasure of the council if they choose to take that direction. Uh, so now I would recommend that, uh, that I would entertain a motion to approve city council resolution number 6338, continuing the declaration of the existence of a local emergency within the city of Los Panas with any uh with any direction to on on how uh, the frequency with which we bring it back to council uh, would anyone like here yeah, i'll make that uh, motion Ms. lewis uh yes i'd like to make a motion to approve resolution number 6338 as read by title and adding in that um when this res when the report has to be brought back to council for consideration that it be done in a 30-day cycle rather than 60. Thank you. I have a motion by Mayor Pro Tem Lewis to approve City Council Resolution Number 6338 uh, with the uh, with the stipulation of bringing it back information for, uh, within 30 days. Do I have a second? Mayor, Councilman Jones here. I'd like to second that. Thank you, Mr. Jones. I have a motion by Council uh, Mayor Pro Tem Lewis, second by Council Member Jones to approve City Council Resolution 6338 um, as read with the extra stipulation. Ms. Maloney, roll call. Jones. Yes. Lambert. Yes. Lewis. Yes. Thomas. Yes. Maria. Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Thank you. The declaration of an existence of a local emergency in Los Panos remains in force for another 60 days. Um, to move on to item 11, and this is uh, Mayor Pro Tem Lewis's item, and it has to do with council member request regarding local government losing the battle of local control. And for that, I will go to council member Lewis, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Okay, um, I had uh, made a request uh, to bring uh, this item before the council in regards to uh, land use and zoning. Uh, and also that our council members had been receiving emails from a grassroots um, organization that is trying to work with city councils to uh, support us retaining um, our ability to have jurisdictions over those areas. So I'm, I'm gonna read a, a statement that I put together to make it a little bit easier. At the City of Anderson Council meeting on February 2nd, 2021, Charles Anderson from the California League of Cities Regional Public Affairs Management for the City of Anderson Region made reference to the following, and I am paraphrasing. Uh, he wants to make clear that the California cities for local control is not affiliated with the League of Cities. That the League of Cities does not have a formal position on the resolutions from the California cities for local control. And that California League of Cities feels that it is a duplication of their position. I would like to share with the council that I attended our regional League of Cities meeting on March 11th and the public affairs manager, Jason Ryan, uh, took the same position as Charles Anderson, but in addition, he, he felt that the League of Cities position was being watered down by the California cities for local control. And may I add that the League is, um, in my opinion, becoming less supportive of cities autonomy and agreeing more uh, with our state legislators as far as cities' rights are concerned to uh, govern and manage uh, their own affairs. And um, just to give a, a, an example of state requirement, uh, ADUs 
which are the accessory dwelling units, um, was a mandated ordinance from the state of California without any financial help to offset the impacts to cities. There are 11 other examples cited in the resolution by the city of Torrance, and you can find that on their website. At the San Joaquin region, uh, at the San Joaquin regional meeting of March 11th, the league shared that there were in excess 2,479 bills introduced to the state Senate around housing, land use, and zoning issues in the year of 2020. SB 1120, which was uh, written by Atkins, proposed legislation that would allow a property owner to convert their single family home into a duplex or demolish that home and in its place build two homes on a single family lot. Another alternative would be splitting a single family lot into two and building two additional units, thus placing four homes where there was previously one. This bill was supported by the California League of Cities. If this bill had passed, it would have destroyed the fabric and the value of currently established neighborhoods. Excuse me, Mayor. Sorry, I was losing my battery power. Um, if this bill had passed, it would have destroyed the fabric and value of currently established neighborhoods without cities or residents in the affected areas having a say. Fortunately, this bill died because of time constraints, but Atkins has resurrected the bill again as SB9, which fortunately the League of City is opposing unless it is amended. There are 55 cities that have passed resolutions and 384 elected council members that have signed on in support of California cities for local control. I have signed on as well, along with three of our other council members. The California Cities for Local Control is truly a grassroots organization where one city council member, Mike Griffiths, from the city of Torrance assembled, assembled a volunteer organization of people throughout California and started a way to educate local council members to voice their concerns about Sacramento taking away their state, uh, their state constitutional rights to self-determine what their cities will look like in the future. A resolution and agreement with the California cities for local government is to support cities to stand for strengthening their authority and control as it relates to housing, land use, and zoning issues. Cities in the Valley and in Northern California that have signed on to submit a resolution are Colinga, Mendota, Parlier, Reedley, Gilroy, Palo Alto, Pleasanton, Montessorino, and Atherton. With this information, I am requesting that the Los Banos City Council direct our city attorney or staff uh, as, or other staff members uh, to draft a resolution in support to submit to the uh, California Cities for Local Control and to be brought back to the council at our next meeting of April 7th. And um, we all heard Stacy indicate tonight uh, in the housing element presentation about how difficult it is for us to um, manage some of the requests that the state is coming down with. And um, at the League of Cities divisional meeting that we had, there was a whole host of bills that are being proposed by our legislators and it's impacting cities. There's not a lot of money coming to help out with anything. 
but just a lot of mandates. And we are losing very quickly our self-determination on how we want to see our cities grow and the land use within our cities and the uh, laws to regulate and do the things to keep our cities looking nice and be able to support people from all walks of life. Um, so I, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, our council will be in agreement uh, to support uh, this grassroots effort. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure that uh, the League of Cities uh, would prefer that, you know, other organizations would stay out of it, but the more support you have coming from local elected officials up to Sacramento, letting them know that these draconian measures are not what we want for our cities, the better off we are. And thank you, Mr. Mayor, for the time. Thank you, Mayor Portem Lewis. Well, um, I'll go uh, to the council to uh, get uh, comment and questions. Uh, Mr. Jones? Um, when this came about, I was actually quite, quite excited to see it. So I'm in full support of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Lambert? I, I agree, Mr. Mayor. I, I uh, definitely support it. I did some reading up on it myself. Thank you very much. And Mr. Yamas? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I support it as well. I think it's very important that we uh, collectively uh, do those things that uh, tell Sacramento that uh, it's our cities. And so I support this resolution or this okay. issue. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, you know, there, there are two ways to, to generate, um, generate uh, power or uh, influence. Uh, one is organized money and the other is organized people. And uh, when you get a lot of cities, and if you check that website, you can see how many cities are signing on in here. Um, I, I think that there's a, there's a need. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't see this many cities signing on. And these, some of these state rules are, are draconian, and they, are, they make it very difficult for our city to do its job. And so um, it, everyone seems to be, and I am in agreement as well, um, I, we could act, uh, I think we give staff direction to go ahead and draft a resolution that we would uh, join on to this. Is that uh, Mr. Terrazas, is, would that be clear enough for staff to go to, to move or do you need any more information? Uh, Mr. Mayor, council members, yes, that direction is clear. Uh, there will be an item on the April 7th agenda reflecting the, the council's direction and discussion. Thank you very much. And thank you, Ms. Lewis, for bringing that forward. We the, cities, we the cities have to let the state know. You know what happens? If you've been around, if you've been around state government or federal government, you really they, they, a lot of them are, are isolated in their world, and they really don't think about the consequences of some of their laws. Uh, and we have to make it clear to them. It's the people that are in the on the on the ground, and there's no no more responsive government to the citizens, and uh, no more uh, no more no government has greater direct effect on citizens than the local government, and because of that. Uh, the local government needs to make its voice heard. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now go on to item 12, advisement of public notices, and we have no report there today. So, which takes us to item 13, which is the city manager report. Uh, Mr. Tarasas? Uh, nothing today, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Um, Merced County Association of Governments, P uh, Peninsula Clean Energy and Measure V. Uh, I want to let everyone know MCAG is working on a study of commuters. And I'm, we're trying to see if we have the need and, and uh, a way to develop um, some commuting, maybe van. buses are, are, are a big thing and maybe not the exact system we need, but van pools, including increasing the number of van pools that citizens can really save a lot of money and, and time and maybe stress. Uh, by van pooling, and there's a lot of subsidy money available for that. And so we are working closely with them to, and they're bringing forth that uh, report soon to the MCAG governing board to see where we want to go. We, were in, we had a meeting with them uh, just the other day, and it went very, very well, and we're very well, re very receptive uh, to, and very uh, receptive, and 
they, they understand how, how many of our Los Panas people commute and how big the need is for our commuters to have some, some commuter service. So we're working on that. If we can bring that to fruition, that'll be fantastic. Because I, I, know, I know a lot of my friends commute, and I know they would be very interested if they could, if they could save a lot of the money and the stress, wear and tear on their cars, the fuel bills, and all the rest. Uh, uh, PCE, we want to let everyone know they, are, they have two positions. One is on their board of directors. It's a non-paid. It's a, a, a Citizens Advisory Commission, not the board of directors. The Citizens Advisory Committee, and they want a Los Banas person because they want someone from our region to represent over there if they can. And they still have the professional position uh, open, and they are still taking applications looking for an excellent candidate. That is a professional position with full, uh, I understand, full benefits. Uh, so that's what I have from CAG and PCE. I don't have anything specific for Measure V. Um, once again, I always refer everyone to the city's website on the Pioneer Pacheco Pacheco Pioneer Corridor. That is the primary Measure V uh, project, the regional project. Also notice and note that a lot of our local projects, road projects, are done with Measure V funding. And with that, we'll now move to the council. Oh, Mayor, if I start, sure. If I may. Uh, just just to, to, to provide some advance notice to the council, uh, Peninsula Clean Energy staff person uh, will be agendized for the April 7th meeting uh, to do an update to the council on the process um, in place transitioning to, to Peninsula Clean Energy. Uh, we're having monthly meetings with PCE staff um, and, and wanted to bring the council into that process in the loop and provide an update to the council. So uh, there will be an update uh, on April 7th uh, from the PCE staff. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, and with that, then we'll go ahead and move to the city council member reports. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have no report this evening. Thank you. Council member Yamas. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, the only thing I'd like to say is that uh, I was somewhat alarmed uh, about the new revised numbers regarding uh, violent crime, homicides, uh, and uh, wondering if uh, some restructuring needs to be happening with our departments to ensure that uh, uh, the departments are doing what they're tasked and mandated with. Um, again, be talking to staff more about this because uh, it was quite alarming to see these numbers. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, those numbers are alarming. And uh, I, I assume and I see you setting up with staff and that's what I would recommend. Um, go ahead and get together with staff and, and our chief and our city manager and see what, what can be done. If there's anything we can do from the council, of course, we're always happy to provide that support. Well, thank you for bringing that forward, Mr. Thomas. Mr. Jones? Oh, microphone? There you go. Sorry, I thought I'd click that. So I, I too, was really uh, surprised to see this really high increase in, uh, in crime from 2019 to 2020. So the, the way I see it is code enforcement, police department, they're far too busy to be uh, worrying about businesses that want to open up. They need to get this under control because we can't have two years in a row. That tells us there's uh, leadership issues here. We have two years in a row. So we, we got to get this under control stuff. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Lambert. Uh, nothing from here, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Uh, the crime statistics are disturbing. Uh, they are, they, they are um, many cities uh, regionally. Uh, we have seen a large increase in crime in most cities in our region over the last uh, year, year and a half. And so uh, we'll, let's, let's get on it and uh, see if we can't fix it. Let's see if we can do whatever we can do from here. Um, in my report, I want to wish Rosie Barker a happy birthday. She is Kathy Galicchio's mother. She will be turning 100 years old in April. And that's quite a landmark. Uh, 
Once again, happy birthday, Rosie. Uh, schools are back, the elementary schools are all back in session uh, in a hybrid mode. So when you're driving past schools, there are children present. Uh, watch those speed limits and be very careful. They have an, an unusual schedule coming and going. It's not the traditional classic school schedule. So there may be children there when, you don't, when you're not expecting them. So keep your eyes open as you drive past the schools and keep, uh, keep safe so that everyone stays uh, safe and healthy. Um, more on the schools, I've been in contact. The county has hired a visual and performing arts director countywide, and I've been in, in contact with her uh, about expanding the entire arts programs countywide from a regional standpoint. And uh, we have a great deal of support there, uh, of course, not only because they hired her, but also because the superintendent of Merced County Schools used to be the superintendent of Los Banas Schools. And Dr. Teachin very well understands uh, the, the broad spectrum of the entire county, um, the north, the south, the east, and the west. So we're looking forward to expanding that and benefiting not only our children through the schools, but also our citizen, our entire citizens uh, through, through in, in, enlivening life, rich, enriching our lives with the arts. Now we are going to go into closed session. And for the closed session, we have two items. Item A is a conference with labor negotiators pursuant to government code section 54957.6. Agency designated representatives, city manager Terrazas, city attorney Vaughn, city clerk, human resources director Malony, finance director Williams, legal counsel Tufo, employee organizations, Los Banas Police Officers Association, Los Banas Police Sergeants Association, Los Banas Firefighters Association, Los Banas Police Dispatchers and Community Services Officers Association, the Los Banas Public Employees Union, Local one slash AFSCME and unrepresented miscellaneous employees. And for item B, public employment title city manager pursuant to government code section 54957. We will be logging off the regular meeting now and going into closed session. When the closed session is ended, we will come back out to report and to adjourn to. Uh, the March 30th uh, workshop. So now we will be logging off from the public meeting at 532.
right. Uh, we are back from closed session. And uh, regarding closed session item 16, the report is no reportable action on item A and on item B, direction given to legal counsel. With that, we'll need a motion to adjourn to 4 p.m. Tuesday, March 30th, 2021 to hold a workshop regarding the general plan update growth boundary and sphere of influence and annexation policies, which will be held virtually. Chair will entertain a motion for the adjournment. Mr. Mayor and Council Member Lewis, so moved. Thank you. Second? Mayor, Council Member Jones, I'll second that. Thank you. I have a motion from Mayor for Tim Lewis and a second from Council Member Jones to adjourn. To adjourn. Um, do we, Ms. Mallory, roll call? Jones. Yes. Lambert. Yes. Lewis. Yes. Yamas. Yes. Faria. Yes. Meeting adjourned at 7.56 p.m. Thank you, everyone. See you next week.